Amen. I want to invite you to go ahead and take a seat. If you have your Bible or Bible app, we're going to be in Luke chapter 8 today. And we are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for the remainder of 2022, we'll be focused on the gospel of Luke. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you today, that's okay. You are invited to use one of the Bibles under the seat in front of you. And you'll find Luke chapter 8 on page 1028. And as always, if you don't have a Bible at your home that you can read or understand easily, please take one of our Bibles home with you. Uh, We want you to own it. We want you to read it. We want you to begin to apply it. And if you're looking for life change, and if the world this week just feels a little darkness because of the tragedy in Texas, that we, we feel a little bit of that darkness, We firmly believe that if we read and apply God's word, he will change our lives, that he will bring hope to those who are hopeless. But but the challenge is you and I have to read it and you and I have to apply it. Now, the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The mission of Calvary is not to gather as many people as possible into one room for a weekend. It's actually to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. We want to see Jesus transform people's lives. We want to see Jesus transform marriages and homes and families. We want to help people follow Jesus. Now, by this point in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus had already drawn at least 12 men who were mentioned by name in Scripture, and they became followers of Jesus. Uh, They gave up everything. They gave up their occupation, their livelihood, and they followed Jesus. They made a conscious choice to follow Jesus. And my page won't turn at all now. Now, I know it's a little bit elementary when we talk about following Jesus because you and I know what it means to follow somebody because we all played follow the leader when we were growing up. We all know what it's like for somebody to be walking in front of us and we're to mimic them and we're to step where they stepped, do what they do, or we wouldn't be able to be the follower. We all know what it means to follow. And as we begin the message today, it should be said very plainly that a follower of Jesus follows Jesus. A follower of Jesus doesn't follow the church. A follower of Jesus doesn't follow the crowd. A follower of Jesus follows Jesus. Now, I, since I, I, I have trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I've turned away from my old life and I made the decision when I was 18 to follow Jesus. And that means I try to live my life based on the way that Jesus teaches me to live. I, I try to live my life following the scriptures and I try to apply God's word to my life. And if you've committed your life to following Jesus, you do the same thing that I do. Uh, You try to follow Jesus every day in your life. Some days you're successful and some days you blow it. And you try to follow him. Together as a church, we try to follow Jesus through the difficulties of life. We try to follow Jesus through the storms of life. And in today's passage, Jesus literally floats with his disciples into a storm And he expresses a little bit of frustration over their lack of faith that they demonstrated while the storm was raging around them. And I think that there are some really incredible truths that you and I can draw out of this passage of scripture for us to apply to our lives today. So page 1028, Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and they were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased And there was calm. He said to them, where is your faith? 
And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? Storms were nothing new to the fishermen. This was their occupation. And in this region, whenever a storm uh, popped up, it was a very sudden thing. When a storm uh, overcame on the lake, when a storm, over, a storm overwhelmed while fishermen were out on the lake, it was a dangerous thing. Now, in this moment, the disciples faced a storm. They had this savior of the world in their boat with them, yet they were still convinced that they were going to die. This was a panic moment in the lives of the disciples. Now, if this same storm had popped up and they had been safe and sound on dry land, if this had been a tremendous windstorm and rainstorm and waves were rolling and they were on dry land, it would not have bothered them one bit. They would not have cared but they were out on the water in the boat when the storm blew up. They didn't have life jackets. They didn't have lifeguards. They didn't have the Coast Guard. If a boat filled with water, it would sink. They were looking around at their circumstances and they were acknowledging that this storm is a pretty bad storm and we might actually die if if the water fills the boat up, if the boat sinks, then we have to try to make it to shore. And if we can't make it to shore, we're going to die. They were convinced in this moment that they were perishing, that they were about to die. And I can acknowledge that sometimes when we face storms in our lives, we begin to do the very same thing that the disciples did. Do you, do you see that they began to ask the what if questions? They began to play what if roulette. Their, the fear of the storm was magnified, not because of what was happening. They were afraid of what could happen. They were afraid of the what if. What if the storm doesn't stop? What if the waves get larger? What if the boat fills up too much with water? What if we have to swim to shore? What if we die? Now there's no question that the, fear was, that the storm was fierce. But part of the fear of the disciples was rooted in the what if. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if, what if, what if? And so they were living based, uh, they were living a life of fear based on the what if questions that were going through their minds. And can I tell you that I struggle with that? I struggle with that as a dad. I struggle with that as a husband. I struggle with that as a pastor. I struggle with that what, those what if questions whenever I begin to walk through a storm. When we walk through a storm of life, we actually make it harder on ourselves by imagining the worst case scenario. That's exactly what the disciples did in this, in this story. See, they, their mind completely went to the darkest place possible. I'm going to die. This storm is going to kill me. The water is going to fill up the boats. We're all dead. Jesus, we need you to help us. See, I think that we all have a tendency to do that because of our sinful nature. For instance, when, when Christy and I walk through the, the storm of infertility, we walked through for about six years of infertility. Then we had a miscarriage. And part of the fear that I experienced in that storm was rooted in the question, what if we never have children? What if we can't have children? And my family and I experienced an incredible storm when I was suddenly fired from a church in Virginia when I learned about financial corruption that was taking place from the board of directors. And then what if roulette started happening in my head? What if I never land another ministry position? What if people believe that I did something corrupt? What if I can't 
land a job and put food on the table for my children. What if, what if, that was the hardest part of the storm. And I know that many of you are in a storm today. I know that many of you are in a storm, maybe it's with your marriage or maybe it's with your occupation or maybe it's with your health. But I know that many of you have faced a storm, have walked through a storm or a storm is brewing on the horizon in your personal life. Maybe you learn, gosh, maybe you learn that once again, your spouse has been unfaithful to you. And you're wrestling with the question of what if my spouse abandons me? I know maybe you've received a difficult health diagnosis and the last time that you went to your doctor, he threw out the word cancer and used the word, well, it could be, we wanna rule it out. And your mind starts racing with those what if questions of how am I, what's going to happen to my wife? What's going to happen to my family? Do I have enough insurance? How am I going to make it through? Whatever storm or whatever hardship that you faced or, you fa or you're facing right now, I want you to be convinced that storms are painful experiences that will end. Storms are painful experiences. There's no doubt about it. When we walk through darkness, when we walk through difficulties, it hurts. But they will end. Storms have the ability to rip our hearts out. Storms have the ability to shred our faith. Storms have the ability to reduce us to something that we never thought we would be. But those storms will come to an end, even if they gut you and even if they leave you feeling empty. Storms can change the way that you think about life. If you walk through such a difficult storm, it changes the way you think, it changes your faith, it changes your trust, and sometimes can change your trust in other people. In my college days, there was a tornado that went through our college campus. My wife was on the campus when it happened. Classrooms were wrecked, buildings collapsed, art around the campus was destroyed. The entire landscape of the campus changed but when it was rebuilt, it was better than ever. Had it not been for the storm coming through, new buildings would not have popped up. New technology would not have been available. And I know that maybe some of you have faced a storm in your life and you feel like it's just dragging on. And maybe you came to church today thinking, I can't deal with this storm any longer. I want you to know your storm will end. It has been painful, but it will end. I, I want to encourage you as a church family just to say this out loud for the affirmation of other people that are walking through a storm in life. Say, this storm is bad, but it will end. Say it like you mean it. This storm is bad, but it will end. And we have to remember that when we walk through difficulties and challenges and seasons of our life that we would never choose to, they are temporary. It is a storm and it's going to end. And the conflict in your marriage is going to end. So keep following Jesus through it. The conflict with your family can end. If you keep following Jesus, it can bring glory to him. Now, it may not end the way that we would hope. Storms don't always have that happy, glossy ending. Sometimes the health storm that a loved one faces doesn't end up the way that we hoped it would end up. And unfortunately, maybe your spouse has already walked away. Maybe that, that husband or wife has already abandoned you. And you're left hurting and you're left devastated. And that storm of conflict ended not in the way that you desired. Maybe the impact of the storm has left your life reeling. You feel like you're just there to pick up the pieces. 
Can I just tell you, if, if that is you today, if that is where you're at today, if you've been so devastated by tragedy, I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry for the hurt that you're walking through. I'm sorry for the pain that you're experiencing right now. But I will tell you this, I believe that God is able to rebuild our lives better than we could ever rebuild it ourselves. God is able to take the broken pieces of our lives and he is able to rebuild it and give us something far better than we could ever create or imagine or build ourselves. But we have to choose to keep following him. We have to choose to keep following him when we're in the middle of the storm. Have you ever noticed that when people are in the middle of a storm or when something tragic or when something bad happens, that people tend to throw out the question, why is God doing this to me? Why did God let this happen to me? Uh, it's funny how people take credit for the good that happens in their lives and they blame God for the bad that happens in their lives. When, when, something's good, when something good happens in their lives, they, they kind of, hey, look at what I accomplished. Look at this wonderful blessing that I've received. But inside they feel like they've accomplished it or they've earned it or they've deserved this blessing. But when something bad happens, when something tragic happens, even with the tragedy that's occurred this past week in Texas, people ask the question, why did God let this happen? Storms happen in our lives. We all acknowledge that, but I want you to understand storms have three main sources. The three main sources, the three main problem, or the three main reasons why you and I experience storms in our lives. First one is because we live in a broken world. Some of the storms that we face in our lives come from the reality that we live in a broken world. When you walk outside this evening after leaving worship, you're going to look around at creation and it looks beautiful and it looks wonderful, but please note, this is not the way God designed our world to be. You and I live in a broken world. We have viruses, we have diseases, infertility, cancers, accidents, injuries, heart attacks, strokes, high cholesterol, tornadoes, earthquakes, natural disasters that happen because we live in a world that sin broke. God did not design the world to be the way it is. It's not supposed to be like this. When God first created the world, he created Adam and Eve. He looked around at all the world and said, this is good. It was perfect. It was paradise. Then Adam and Eve chose to not follow God. They chose to sin and sin broke the world because Adam and Eve chose to live the way they wanted to live, reject God, sin was born, sin brought death, and all of nature was impacted by sin. So when natural disasters happen, when earthquakes happen, or when diseases occur, it's not God's fault. God did not create the world this way. It's because Adam and Eve messed it all up. And by the way, you and I keep messing it up too every single day. Every single one of us, sin was born and the good world went bad. And that leads us to the second cause of storms in our lives. Storms don't just happen because of uh, sin that we live in a broken world. It's actually caused by our sinful nature. See, some of the storms that I face in my own life are personally brought on by me because I'm a sinner and because I mess up. I've done stupid things that have caused storms in my life. 
For instance, I've said this before, I'll say it again because I try to live transparently. My wife and I have been married for about 22, 23 years, but the, thank you. My wife says it feels like forever. Do you understand the joke? It feels like a really long time, Never mind. All right. You did, I just didn't deliver it well. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. The woo messes me up. I'm living in a broken world. Sinful nature, right? Because of my sinful nature, our first two and a half years of marriage was terrible. We fought all the time. We bickered back and forth. Nothing was ever right. It was because of me. It was because of my sinful nature, because of my selfishness because of my stupidity, because of the actions that I lived out, it was because of me. I created a storm in our marriage because of my sinful nature. I wanted my own way. My sinful nature can create storms around me and so can yours. Your sinful nature can create storms of conflict with with your spouse, with your family members, with people that you work with. Your sinful nature can bring about storms in your life that you have to navigate and you have to walk through. Have you ever had a selfish attitude with your spouse or is it just me? Right? So you, you've created storms as well. Has your spouse ever given you the silent treatment because of their sinful nature? Right? It, it causes that storm. And often I make things worse because of my sinful nature. Like the storm is bad and then I just make things worse. I often find myself falling short of the person that God has created me to be. Do you? And those storms are caused because of our own sinful nature. So let's pray for one another. Because if we don't keep following Jesus, we're going to create more storms around us. Our sinful nature can really mess things up, especially when it comes to relationships. And the third cause of storms that we face in our lives is really spiritual attack. It's a, it's a spiritual attack. If you're a follower of Jesus, God loves you unconditionally. He is for you. He wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. He wants you to be blessed. He rejoices over you. He loved you enough to send his son to die on a cross to pay the price for your sin. God is for you. He wants you to know him personally. He wants you to be reconciled to him. He wants you to have a right relationship with him. And if God is that much for you, you can be sure that the devil hates you. Satan is a God hater. He wants to destroy everything that God loves because that's the way he is. And Satan wants to do everything he can to destroy your relationship with God. Why? Because God loves you. He wants to destroy your faith in God. He wants to ruin that life-changing testimony that you have. He wants to ruin it. He wants to turn your story of faith into a story of fear, into a story of doubt, into a story that's walked away from your relationship with God. So he causes storms to come in your life. So storms come to our lives. The storms we experience in our lives come from our, our, a broken world. They come from sinful nature. And they also are spiritual attacks So what can we learn through the disciples' way that they operated inside the story? They were in the boat. The storm came. Fear overwhelmed the disciples. They woke Jesus up. He stopped the storm and he stopped the waves. And then he rebuked the disciples and said, where is your faith? And the way that I read this passage, I read it as Jesus saying, where is your faith? He woke up, 
He stood up in the boat, maybe, right? In my mind, I see it happening. Standing up in his boat, lifting up his arms, like Moses lifted up his arms over the Red Sea and says to the waves, stop. To the storm, stop. To the winds, stop. Then he rebuked his disciples and said, where's your faith? Why didn't you do something about this storm? Why didn't you take action? It's important that as we look at this passage of scripture, we look back at the context once again and building up to the story in scripture, Jesus emphasized repeatedly over and over again that a follower of Jesus does what he tells them to do. A follower of Jesus lives in obedience. A follower of Jesus lives by faith. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Luke 6, 49, Jesus said, but anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. Luke 8, 18, Jesus said, so pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. In Luke 8, 21, right before this passage, passage begins. Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Leading up to this passage, Jesus is teaching that faith and action are connected together. Faith and action are connected together through obedience. Jesus had personally been teaching his disciples to demonstrate their faith. And this storm was a moment that the disciples were able to stand up if they wanted to in that boat. This was a moment for them to exercise their faith and their belief that Jesus is able, that through the name of Jesus, they too would be able to say to the storm, stop, and it would stop. This was their moment to live by faith, but instead they chose to be controlled by fear. I want to invite you as you walk through the storms of your life to do what the disciples did not do in this passage. During the storms that you face, show others your faith. During the storms that you face in your life, show other people your faith. That's called transparent living. That's called not having all the answers when you walk through difficulties. Other people around you, when you walk through storms, need you to demonstrate your faith. And Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples to heal other people. They healed people of diseases, they cast out demons, and they went out and they worked miracles by faith for other people. There's nowhere in scripture that we find somebody working a miracle for themselves, to bless themselves. See, when we live transparently, we're demonstrating that we firmly believe our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And when we walk through storms and difficulties that everybody around us faces, they can see us living our lives transparently. We get to demonstrate our faith. They're going to want that relationship with God that you and I have because we're demonstrating faith and resiliency in the midst of the storm. So when you're walking through a storm in your life, that's the last time, or that, that's not the last time. You don't need to pull out your involvement in following Jesus, in the mission of Jesus. You don't need to stop serving because you're walking through a storm. That's the time when you step up, live transparently and demonstrate your faith. 
Show other people your faith in Jesus by choosing not to allow fear of the storm to discourage you. Choose not to allow to be led by the what if questions and live your life according to faith in Jesus. And even when you're not in a storm, followers of Jesus we practice our faith so that other people can become a follower of Jesus. That is our mission. That is what we're called to do, whether we're walking through a storm or not. So grab a serve card and write out on that card that you want to get involved somewhere and you want to serve. Tell us an area of ministry that you want to get involved in. Tell us that you are ready to live out your faith. Because when Jesus looked at his disciples and he said to them, where is your faith? I hear Jesus saying that to me when I walk through storms. Joe, you're walking through the storm. Demonstrate to the world that you're a follower of Jesus by living out your faith practically in ways that make sense. Demonstrate to the world during the storm that you are a Christ follower. And when you and I begin to do that, when we begin to say, this storm is not gonna be long, this storm is gonna be short term, I'm going to commit to follow Jesus through the storm, even though it's hard, even though it can be overwhelming, even though I have to fight back the what ifs, we're going to find that our lives will continue to point people to Jesus and lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. We get to bring hope to other people. Other people get to rest in the shade of our faith when they're walking through storms and they're walking through blistery heat. We get to live our lives by faith in such a way it brings hope and encouragement to those around us. Don't you wanna do that? Don't you think this world needs a little more encouragement and a little more hope? We understand that everybody walks through some type of storm. So let's demonstrate our faith to the very best of our ability when we go through the storms so that other people can find that hope in Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, we have a hard time being thankful for the storms that we experience in our lives. We have a hard time walking through sometimes the health diagnosis or the tragedies that occur. But Lord, when they do happen, help us to live our lives in such a way that we encourage other people to follow you. Help us to demonstrate a boldness in our faith, that we can say to the mountain, we can say to the tree, get up and move and it will happen. Help us to live believing and following you. Father, it's our prayer that you would continue to guide us, continue to transform us, help us all to become fully devoted followers of Jesus for the very rest of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.